Coming up on Market to Market, more flooding in California with severe weather again in the south. Protesters at the Capitol in Brazil over the recent election. Farmers get movement on the right to repair and a major government report with analysis by Naomi Bloom and Matthew Bennett next. What's the most complex industry on earth? It's not genetics or meteorology or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing, store now, profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today. This is the Friday, January 13th edition of Market to Market, the weekly journal of rural America. Hello, I'm Paul Yeager. There were no shortage of headlines this week impacting rural America. John Deere and the American Farm Bureau Federation agreed to a memo of understanding to ensure farmers and ranchers have the right to repair their own equipment. Supporters of the former Brazilian president stormed several government buildings at the Capitol in Rio de Janeiro over the weekend, while severe weather again slammed the nation with heavy rains on the west that caused flooding and deadly tornadoes that hit the south. And a government report released revealed inflation decreased a tenth of a percent from November, the first drop since May of 2020. Another snapshot from Washington, D.C. is prompting us to pause our regular format and spend time with two of our market analysts. Naomi Bloom is the Senior Market Advisor for Total Farm Marketing. And Matthew Bennett is co-founder of agmarket.net. We'll get to both of you in just a moment. However, we do need to give you the numbers that we will use as the backdrop for our discussion. A majority of bullish news drove the market higher following Thursday's release for the week. The nearby wheat contract was even, while the March corn contract added 21 cents. The USDA report boosted the soy complex on lower production. The March soybean contract improved 35 cents, while March meal shed $1.30. March cotton sold off 338 per hundred weight. Over in the dairy parlor, February class three milk futures gained seven cents. The livestock market was mixed as February cattle were up 95 cents. March feeders cut 277. And the February lean hog contract dropped $1.63. In the currency markets, the US dollar index lost 171 ticks. February crude oil rallied 608 or 8% per barrel. COMEX Gold improved 48.90 per ounce. And the Goldman Sachs Commodity Index finished up by more than 32 points at 605.50. Let's bring in Matt Bennett and Naomi Bloom back to the... We'll bring you into the discussion. You're not really back. I knew, you never said anything. Matt, we'll get to you in a moment. We have to start with Naomi. Let's talk wheat. Uh, a lot of movement post-report. Mm -hmm. Was it tied to the report, or was that just a sympathetic move to what happened in corn and soybeans? I think it was a little bit more of a sympathetic move to what happened with corn and beans. The wheat did have some friendly notions to it from the report and some bearish notions to it. So on the friendly side, the quarterly stocks number came in a little bit less than they were expecting. And then just the regular monthly USDA report had lower than expected ending stocks as well. So to me, that says that you know, we still have historic tight supplies in this country, every single category of wheat. And so that is something that we are aware of going forward, especially with the global situation still having overall tight supplies of wheat as well. What I loved about how wheat finished after the report was that we put in a bullish key reversal on that news that was, again, you know, friendly from the ending stocks perspective. But the acre side had a little bit of a different story. There was one theory that it was a buying opportunity missed before the report. Was it because of the acres that Naomi's leading you to talk about or my question instead? 
Uh, I, I, in my opinion, Acres, uh, the thing about wheat, you come into the January report and you typically, it's not as big of a deal as corn and soybeans. You know, I mean, corn and beans is what we're really paying very close attention to. Of course, you want to look at what wheat acres look like. Well, with the kind of wheat prices we've had over the last year, it's not hard to believe that you would come in here with three and a half million plus wheat acres for total wheat, total wheat over what you had uh, a year ago. And the thing is, I guess, whenever you look at that it's going to create quite a situation whenever we talk, start talking acreage moving forward, you know, for corn and beans. And so, you know, those, I wouldn't say they're etched in stone. Obviously, this wheat crop went into dormancy in not phenomenal shape. But the nice thing is we've seen a significant amount of moisture other than maybe Kansas down into uh, uh, Texas. We've seen quite a bit of moisture here over the last couple, three weeks, and we're healing up a little bit. I'm not so sure that this wheat crop might be fairly decent. I don't know that you'll see the abandonment we once thought we'd see. In the wheat belt. Or do you think we'll see abandonment in other areas? I mean, California has erased the majority of their most severe drought. Not a lot of wheat is grown there, though. No, not much wheat's grown there by any means. But the thing about it, when you talk to some of these folks looking at weather, California, uh, snow in the Rockies, I mean, you're, you're changing the environment a little bit from what we've seen the last two to three years probably setting ourselves up for the potential at least that maybe we would see a little bit better weather pattern here in 23. That's something that we can't ignore moving forward. So Naomi, I guess I'll ask, um, I want to ask kind of the other question I asked to Matt. Do you think we put the low in in wheat and we're higher forward? I do think that this was the low. We don't have a reason to just take off and rally, but for Chicago wheat, $7 support is significant. And then the Kansas wheat and Minneapolis wheat have strong support at the $8 level. Uh, to Matt's point, we don't know how these acres are going to come out of dormancy. And I'm thinking back to the administration's desire to have the double crop incentive program between the wheat and beans, so maybe that's a little bit more of the extra acres that we found. Um, but a lot can happen yet with weather. But I do feel that the low is in for now seasonally. Wheat has a tendency to rally until March. So um, just make sure that you're making and taking advantage of those opportunities when the rallies come. Matt, what was the headline to you in the corn report? Oh, a couple of things. One thing that jumps out at me as I look at it afterwards is that you lowered demand 185 million bushels and we had a lower carry. I mean. Those two things typically, uh, I don't think anybody had that on their bingo card. I can tell you that. And so, uh, yes, you drop acreage uh, significantly, you know, and so you come down, yield goes up. I mean, so look at all these moving parts, things that you wouldn't think would necessarily go together, but yield goes up. We thought yield would come up some because September and October you went down on yield. You came up in November, and a lot of times when that's the case, you reverse course in November, you see a little bit of a further, uh, you know, increase or reduction, depending on what the trend was. But my thing is, is that you actually kept carry out fairly consistent, but the main takeaway to me is that you're in a situation right now, Paul, where demand is lowered. And that's not necessarily a great thing moving forward. You have to pay attention to it. So I think it's more of a supportive thing as far as old crop's concerned. But new crop, we better pay close attention to what's going on moving forward. The lower demand story has been a frequent topic for a while that the, the numbers were going to have to reflect. There's just not as much interest in U.S. corn. Right. Right. So the so going forward, I'm thinking that we will see exports actually stay a little bit lower because Brazil now is going to be a really big competition for us and helping to take over that Ukraine number. So I kind of I'm, I'm a little nervous that, you know, we're not going to stop corn exports, but I don't know that they need to go back up to where they were. I think you'll see a growth in ethanol demand. I think you're going to see the growth in the feed demand over time. So we'll recover that. But right now we're we're kind of stuck. So to Matt's point, um, going forward on the new balance sheets that we're going to start to talk about in the spring, if that is lost demand and if we even plant the acres that we planted last year with trend line yield, with the demand that we just got yesterday, carryout grows to 2 billion bushels with wonderful weather. Um, we are still trading in a pennant flag formation on charts for corn markets. So what we did on this week after the report put in that bullish reversal now we're back up to the high side of the pennant flag if we can get some friendly news the market's going to work higher towards seven dollars with the march contract um, and then that'll help some of the new crop because we'll have to see acres um, the competition for the acres continue going forward and i think you can get a little bit of, of a better new crop price but we're just lacking an immediate bullish story at the moment but the report at least helped us to not fall apart. 
Well, I think Naomi, I shouldn't have read her the question ahead of time because she's gonna. We're gonna read the question now that came in. Uh, let's do Husker in Nebraska, um, and, and this is a question that I think many of you have had: is why price or sell anything new crop in twenty three related? Until harvest, it's worked in 20, 21, 22. My neighbor with no plan has sold at great prices, Matt. Plus, we have new soybean crush plants coming online, and that'll affect domestic demand. Is Husker right? That's a wonderful question. It's something that we all struggle with, quite frankly, is, is you know, what I've done over the last couple, three years, you know, has it worked, so I'm going to do what someone else said worked for them. First of all, I hope his neighbor was being honest with him because lots of times when we <laughs> talk markets, they're not, they're not honest. But here's what I'm going to tell you. Why, why would I want to do something ahead of time? Like lock in a worst case scenario is the way that I put it. And here's why. What if you plant 91 million acres, mm -hmm. Paul? You know, and what if you hold demand constant from one marketing year to the next, then her trend line yield gives you a 2-2 two, two or 2-3. Two, and if you sit here with a, I don't think that we can't raise a 180 plus crop this year. If the environment calls for it, the genetics are there. We have the ability to do so. People didn't cut corners with the money in their pocket that they had this year. They needed the write-off. They paid for the fertilizer. And so the bottom line is we're set up to have a really good year, especially if Mother Nature cooperates. So why would I do something a little different this year? There's nothing that says that you can't lock in the worst case scenario and participate to the upside. That's what a lot of these strategies and tools are that we try to put together. You almost said amen there, I think. <laughs> Preach, brother. No, I, th where I wanted to build on what he said because um, now you lost my train of thought, Sorry. Paul. <laughs> Sorry, I got you into the pulpit. No, it's and... okay, it's okay. I think my point was just more that going forward, we have, um, you know, just these potential for bigger acres. We have the potential for fantastic yield. And so the underlying question, I think, of that is, what are the odds of $8 corn again? And so what's different this year is that the dollar's higher than it was a year ago. What's different this year is that so far the Brazil weather is good, and that's different than last year. The war element is gone. We have higher interest rates. So all of those extra little friendly things that were there last year, they're not there right now. Yeah, so another, that's another reason why right. what worked last year isn't necessarily going to work this coming year. I, and, and I'll continue. We're just going to keep building here, okay? But the thing is, is that you've lost demand, Paul. Okay, so what, what did high prices do? Yeah, we want $7, $8 corn, right? I always tell people, be careful what you wish for. Because a lot of us would maybe do a little bit better with five, five fifty, even four fifty at times with input costs where they were at the time, than to race up to seven dollars. Because we all know that the fertilizer prices this last fall for most of us were significantly higher than what they are today. Okay, so the bottom line is we've lost some demand because high price of corn did what it was supposed to do. And so moving forward, you can't expect that demand to just magically return. It's not going to happen overnight. And so I've got to be really cautious. You look at the last three times, these last three rallies, so 08, 12, and 22. Look at what happened in 2009. Look at what happened in 2013. Ask yourself if the same type of pattern happens that you saw those two years, happens in 23, what are you going to do? I mean, you at least have to have a plan for it. So we joke about, I shouldn't joke. Last week on the show, Mark Gold said, I think we're headed lower. I don't see a reason that we go much higher than we are. Sell now, don't store anything. Given the, the eight, nine points that you've talked about in the last year that you've been on the show of these things all align and a lot of them aligned, you're already, you've already ticked off, I think, four. You've pulled them back off the list. So was this rally in the last two days a sugar high that we're going to fall off of? Um, Pay attention to the seasonals, and we still have the South American weather to continue to get through, and we still have to make sure that these acres get in the ground. So the, the reality is, if the seasonals can continue to work as they've been working quite well, soy, soy acres, soy prices, and corn prices have a tendency to peak right at that February USDA report. Last year, they hit all of their upside technical objectives right into that report, and the only reason that we rallied after that was because of the war. So um, normally, you'll see firmer prices into February, and then that's it, because then we start talking USDA Outlook Forum. Yeah. Happy acres from here to the moon, and record yield, and then prices have a tendency to pull back. So use the rallies and be more aggressive with the sales. Matt, what's your headline off of the soybean section of the report? I mean, ultimately, okay, yield comes down, acreage comes down, 
Uh, you lost a little bit on exports, but the carryout went from 220 to 210. Okay, so U.S. it wasn't that big of a deal, but I tell you what, whenever you lower Argentina down to 45 and a half, it gets lower down, and then you take a look at the world balance sheet, you're still building stocks year on year. And so you gotta ask yourself, we, the rally's been profound, right, over the last few weeks. It was a soybean meal-led rally based on the fact Argentina was dry, but if you look at South American production as a whole, it's going to be up. Very likely that it's gonna be up as a whole, and so, if I'm holding on to beans or if I'm trying to figure out what to do with uh, new crop beans, I've got to understand that typically whenever we're building world stocks, we're not necessarily going to see a big rally from there. And so I think the report's biggest news is that world stocks are growing at a time when the headlines have been all about an Argentine drought. Do you buy that stocks is more of a driver right now? It's keeping us supported overall. I, I feel that the market, you know, we're in this really lovely uptrending channel for the soybean prices. I feel that we're going to be able to go back and test the summer highs. We're actually only like 30, 40 cents from that when you look at what the March contract had for summer highs. And that's going to be your point to be making the sales. Circling back to that soy meal or the soy processing question, I looked back at USDA reports all the way back to May, and the USDA has not put in new demand for these upcoming crush plants. And granted, they're going to take two to three years to come on board, but if you do the math, slow math, conservative math, it should increase demand for the crush by 200 million bushels a year. That's just between now and then. If okay. everything comes online, so it'd be 200 million this upcoming year, another 200 million after that, another 200 million after that, if they all come online. Um, so then we will need to see additional acres, but I feel that we are going to keep our export numbers on the more conservative side because of what Brazil has the ability to do. So we'll see increased demand for crush, but I think that our export numbers are going to stay at this little bit more modest 2 billion bushel mark. Um, but the USDA has not accounted for the increase of crush demand yet. And so that's what I want to wait when they get to their USDA outlook forum in February. I want to see them talk about that. I want to see how they're going to account for that. And I want to see then, because the soybean market will need more acres yeah. because of that. Right. And that's been talked about. But I guess is that one of those, you, it's not a pie in the sky thing. you got to do a whole lot of work to get a plant online. Mm -hmm. So if we know that the plant is under construction, we should figure that those things are coming. So I guess, Matt, you get to answer this question that is a little bit of a tie out uh, of what Naomi was kind of, uh, around and I probably should have asked this in corn, but it still applies in beans. Can this is from uh, Steve in South Dakota? Can U.S. producers handle pre-COVID, pre-Ukrainian war grain price levels, or did we just run up our tab with wishful thinking, assuming these high prices are here to stay? And the reason I ask that: Are these soybean prices here to stay? You get the sugar question now. Are we just blipping up for something lower? So. Okay. So as of the calendar turn. Uh, July beans were the highest that they'd ever been as of Jan 1 by a buck 51 a bushel, okay? And so at that point, you know, and to go back to what you were saying about Mark, a lot of what Mark said last week made a whole lot of sense. He didn't know what the report was going to say, but the bottom line is how bullish do you want to be at $15 beans? So you got to ask yourself, okay, what am I willing to risk here? Because a lot of times that extra 20, 30, 40 cents can cost us two bucks because it's so hard when the market turns to get ourselves away from the idea that, oh, it's going to go back and visit the highs. And so are soybean prices here to stay at these levels? I think right now we've got some support, no question. But if you would turn off uh, wetter in the areas of Brazil that are, that are dry, we've got a few, uh, but mostly southern Brazil into Argentina, I would be not want to be in a situation where I had a ton of risk to the downside because as a producer, uh, I feel like you could be sitting around a couple, three months from now saying, why and what was wrong with $15 beans? What was wrong with $7 corn? Um, and so I don't think they're here to stay for perpetuity by any stretch of the imagination. And I would much rather quantify my situation if I really want to see the upside, put a floor under the thing, uh, let the upside run if he gets an opportunity, but don't just sit here and do nothing just because you think that, whatever, someone told you they think beans are going to 16 bucks. Or your neighbor had success doing something else. Yeah, and I, I agree, store and ignore. I just really still strongly feel is not the theme for this year. And take advantage of the rallies and assume that the weather is gonna improve. I mean, we're already seeing the weather patterns different. 
Um, the, the weather pattern for South America, they're thinking that it's going to be improving starting in February. The question is, is it going to be anything helpful to that Argentina crop or not? Um, and so I just, if it was mine, I would absolutely, any rally we see into the February winter rally, I would be making old crop sales and new crop sales without question. Okay. Uh, Matt, we talked a little bit about some acreage. We have be better acreage reports coming. I want to, in the sense of cotton, we've been range bound here. Um, there's been a couple of breakouts and then this week hit and we are wondering, are we buying acres at this point? I don't think so. I mean, you've got some work to do if you're going to buy acres. That anything in the 80s to me is is, is tough to get someone, especially after uh, triple digit cotton this past year. So. I'm not so sure you're buying any acres there. I think it's going to be tough. And so, you know, you've got, 50, uh, well, $14 uh, level beans, you know, for November, uh, obviously. And, and in some areas of the Delta, that's what you're going to substitute. You know, corn prices, obviously, in, uh, for instance, Texas and uh, parts of Kansas, basis has just been incredible. Uh, I still think those folks are going to go towards corn. I mean, you can sit here and talk about $6 D's corn all day long, but when someone had $2 over, or a buck ninety over this past fall, do the math, that's 8 bucks, And so, so, you know, I think cotton's probably got some work to do to buy acres. Yeah, you know, prior to the report for cotton, I really thought that cotton needed to buy 2 million more acres because the ending stocks were so tight. But with the way that the USDA increased the ending stocks for cotton on this report, and now I think cotton only would need, maybe need to buy 1 million more acres than last year in order to get the ending stocks to just be at a comfortable level. I disagree with the USDA that they think U.S. consumption, global consumption is going to be down uh, because China is opening up again and people here in this country still have jobs. They might not you know, buy as much as they were, uh, but I'm going to be shopping. And so and I think a lot of people in this country still are going to be shopping. So I feel that the demand is going to be there a little bit more than what they think it's going to be, again, especially with China opening. We're still buying beef, too. Oh, yeah, we're buying beef. I mean, Absolutely. cash business, though, a uh, little slower this week in the live cattle market, but consumers still appears to be buying beef. Yep, domestic demand continues to be strong. Our export market, fantastic. Weekly export the sales this week, 14,000 tons, I think is what I saw, which was the best it had been in a couple months. So the demand is there. Uh, we're getting up to some higher prices, though. Demand's there, and also supply is is not there like yeah. it was before. And so, you know, highest cow slaughter you'd had since 1984 in the month in the year of 2022. I mean, that's kind of a big deal. I mean, you look at this cattle herd inventory; it's just not what it was a year ago. And this is at a time when people still feel like they can pay for, you know, mm -hmm. beef. We know consumer sentiment maybe is a, has got a little bit of a shine off of it, you know, with interest rates. So we, we understand that. But at the same time, uh, it sure seems to me people want to eat beef still. Demand's been strong. And whenever supply's where it is, I've told you, Paul, in the last few times that I'm fairly friendly to fat cattle. And I think if the equities market holds intact, Yes, price is already fairly high, but I think in the third and fourth quarter, and this is a futures market, so it could happen before, I still look for, you know, maybe even on the board a 175 type price for fats. I think it's possible. Mm. Yeah, and there's a but, January 31st um, cattle report coming up with the big cattle inventory numbers, so that'll be really important to watch in terms of what are we actually doing to potentially have replacements down the road. So that'll which, tell us. Which gets us more. to live ca or to feeders here a little bit, Naomi. Um, is so you're saying that's a factor not as much of a factor tied to the grain price the feed price right now um, well it, it's all oh. a moving yeah. component so the feeder cattle fell below support uh, today 184 had been support and it went below there I think part of it was more of a technical move plus the fact that corn did not fall apart it made the uh, cattle feeder cattle market just have a pullback it still is not an uptrend in the big picture it just broke that short-term upward channel line, okay. but I feel that and there's no feeders out there. So there's, it still is, a, it's a friendly marketplace. Are there hogs out there? Oh, and are they, they're cheaper right now. They're cheaper right now, but a lot of this has to do with, okay, is China going to reopen? Is demand going to be as strong as we once thought that it would be? And I happen to think that it will, but they've been pretty darn cheap. I, I'm still friendly protein overall. I feel like maybe they've gone do down enough for now, but still, the triple-digit di hogs that you see on farther out, uh, I have a hard time getting your front months anywhere near that. So uh, the market where it's at, I don't have a big issue there.
Any issue on hogs? Um, it's down near the October lows, so near the 77 level. I feel like we're going to see recovery bounce to about 84, 85. If you were looking to do a spec trade this upcoming week, I'd be jumping into hogs for just a short-term correction higher. But we don't have any friendly news. That's just the reality right now. Our export sales continue to be slow. So we've got to get some friendly news somehow, somewhere. But... You know what we also have to get in? Our goodbyes. <laughs> Goodbye, Naomi. Thank you. Thanks, Goodbye, Paul. Matt. Thanks, Paul. Appreciate it. We are going to put a pause on this analysis and continue our discussion about these markets and more in Market Plus. You can find those segments on our website at markettomarket.org. All of these resources mentioned are free. We have three podcasts that drop each week. The Market Analysis, which basically you've just heard. The Market Plus, which we're about to record. And the MTOM Show. Subscribe today where you get your podcasts. Next week we look at how solar is adding to the bottom line on the farm. Thank you so much for watching and have a great week. Market to Market is a production of Iowa PBS, which is solely responsible for its content. What's the most complex industry on Earth? It's not genetics, or meteorology, or logistics. It's a business that involves them all. It's farming. Thank you, farmers, from Pioneer. Sukup Manufacturing Company, providing equipment and buildings to store and condition grain to help farmers adjust to market swings. We build drying, moving, and storage equipment designed to preserve the quality of their crops. Sukup Manufacturing. Store now. Profit later. Tomorrow, for over 100 years, we've worked to help our customers be ready for tomorrow. Trust in tomorrow. Information is available from a Grinnell Mutual agent today.